Dom Harvey. Andy Bungold. How are you doing? Did you just call him Bungold? <laughs> that's, that's what it sounded like. <laughs> what, what was that? <laughs> well, I, I, I was trying to think if, if someone asked me why the band magic he was called that, what answers I could give them. And so I could say, it's your, uh, it's your alter ego, Mandy Bungold. Um, <laughs> or it could be... Andy Bungold could be uh, Bundy Mangold, I think, still works as well. Like, lots, lots of permutations in there. So a lot uh, of good you, you can really uh, mix and match however you like. But I don't think we'll have any shortage of things to talk about. I, uh, I think we're a very talkative bunch, even though my voice is still struggling to, re- to recover from the weekend. <laughs> All right, let's yes, just. I, uh, I can imagine. Let's just yeah. dive in then, and uh, welcome everybody listening to a brand new episode of Lucky Paper Radio. My name is Andy, and I am here as always with my co-host, Anthony Squirrel Token Maddox. I was on a Squirrel Token at CubeCon. It was very cool. John Terrell did a great job making. I mean, this was just a really cool thing, actually, making tokens that featured a lot of the special guests at the event, featured as like a creature type that they they were had some affinity for, and so I got to be a little squirrel on some random guy's shoulder. I think it's really nice to give, uh, you know, very D or E tier celebrities like us a little sense yeah. of what it might be like to have uh, <laughs> some celebrity with a token in our name. That's uh, very fun. I agree. Oh, we're back from QCon, Anthony, and we are um, sleepy. Are you sleepy? I'm sleepy. I'm still sleepy. Yeah. I slept a lot last night. I've been sleeping still a lot sleepy. the past couple nights, still catching up, and my voice is a little bit toasted still. You know, I did uh, coverage a bunch over the weekend, including two coverage slots on Saturday, and then... After that, I went home and screamed about Super Smash Brothers until about 3 a.m. So I can know. I can attest to this. Yes, you did a <laughs> lot of screaming. It, look, sometimes it gets really intense, and you just got to scream it out. So uh, our voices are weak. We're going to have someone else join us on this episode to uh, liven things up a little bit. We've got a special guest with us, fresh off of a Pro Tour Top 8 in Barcelona and a fantastic performance at KubeCon. It is returning guest, Dom Harvey. What's up, Dom? Well, thank you. It's great to be here. I would say I'm a C tier celebrity with B tier aspirations, but we're not quite there just yet. But uh, happy to take whatever invites like this I, I can get. Great to be back with you guys. It was great to see you there and great to see you there at KubeCon. I mean, this was, I would say, of all the magic events I've been to, uh, some of them have a special place in my heart for various reasons. But pound for pound, I think this is, I, I think, the best magic event I've been to. And uh, hopefully it will rise to even greater heights next year. I will say, I think you might have tipped your hand to the organizers by, uh, I heard, maybe it was Jay Bro or Parnell, I can't remember who told me that you said that you uh, you were sad you missed the first year and you didn't plan on missing any in the future, and uh, you know, you're just you're just leaving equity on the table, and how are they going to bribe you to come now if you told them you're going to come every year and you love it so much? Well, they already gave me uh, the best token I could have asked for. Uh, John did a, an amazing job with my my construct, which frankly paints me in a much more uh, chadly light than I would say I, I gave off in person, you know, uh, physique-wise and just <laughs> overall vibe-wise, but uh, I, I will be using that one whenever I advocate Urza Saga for a long time to come, I think. I think he kind of chattified everybody a little bit, you know, very, very generous... Uh takes on people's photos which is appropriate you know art is about celebrating uh, ideals you know yeah i look like a real saint francis of azizi chad <laughs> anyway also they should have called that token the domstruct I'm, I'm pretty offended that it doesn't say domstruct on the top instead of construct but we'll work on that for next year yeah always room for improvement all right dom we uh you know we always like having you on the show and you're welcome back anytime you want to talk about really whatever you want but i thought it'd be fun to have you on the show specifically to talk about what it's like drafting I don't know. How many cubes did you draft this weekend? Like a dozen drafts this weekend at uh, a KubeCon? And you you were in the number two ranking seat going into top 64 just behind Reed Duke. I think uh, I think you did a tweet that said I have the highest ranking among mortals at KubeCon, <laughs> which which was which was a good way of putting it. Uh, so obviously you had a lot of success this past weekend drafting a wide variety of different cubes, and I thought it'd be interesting to talk about from a competitive player perspective. You are obviously a seasoned pro. Got to be one of the most experienced and uh, skilled players at the event. What does it look like to draft that many different kinds of cubes? Or in general, if you just want to talk about what it's like to be a KubeCon overall. So, quick disclaimer. I, I don't want to do your boy, uh, Theo McGrath Dirty. He, uh, once again, was at the top of the standings. I think above both me and Reed by the end was the first seed going into Top 64. Along with uh, someone named Jonathan Leake, who I don't think any of us actually encountered over the weekend or could put a face to the name but it was not losing any matches of magic apparently so uh it was at the top of that that pack with uh with, with those guys and then you had uh other names like ryan sack sam black uh again but baltimore local now julian Henri uh, kind of filling out the the top cut there so starts at the top eight which turned or uh top eight going into the top 64 and i think all of the people that i knew from that top 64 myself included 
lost somewhere in that first draft, and yeah, the top eight was uh, was a bunch of other people, but uh, we, uh, we 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 you know gave each other something to to work for at least. Yeah, I think I learned on Twitter today that that mysterious Jonathan Leak that yeah everybody was walking around the event all weekend like who's this name in the top here that nobody seems to have a personal connection with. I think he's part of the like European crew that does the Q Invitational over there because I saw Thomas Crone tweeting about how he was excited to see Jonathan Leak perform so well. So. Perhaps that's merely a continental divide. Maybe if you're in Europe, Jonathan Leake is a uh, household name among cube spikes. I saw a couple different rankings over the weekend, depending on like what, exactly what time you checked him. But suffice it to say, he played really well over the course of the weekend. And, you know, shout out to Theo. Theo's been on the show before. And uh, I-, I said to you at the end of uh, the second day of the main event that, uh, you know, it was really cool to me that Theo, who's like never played on a pro tour, you know, I think he's done some RCQs and stuff locally, but it's mostly just in college, getting an engineering degree, you know, not really a pro player. It's really cool that he could hang up there with everybody. And you were like, let's get something clear. He's not up here with us. We're up there with him. I mean, he had a really, uh, the best match win rate and game win rate over the entire weekend of everybody when all was said and done. It makes me feel a lot better about all the times that I've been absolutely crushed by Theo at our, you know, local Tuesday cube night. For sure. Absolutely. It does. Cause you never really know if your local end boss is, uh, anybody or just a scrub. And it turns out got a couple people in our play group that are quite good. So it's nice to have that going for us. Yeah, they always say that the best way to improve at Magic is to surround yourself with better players and learn from them. And apparently you have uh, quite the crop of those just right there on your doorstep uh, to, to try and learn from. So what, what's our excuse then for not, for not getting any better? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how we, uh, we're losing our, our uh, excuses here if we keep playing with Theo and Jay and Julian and all these people that are fantastic. And I got to give a shout out to our own Allison too from our play group who actually made it all the way to top eight. Like you said, a lot of the big names fell out in the top 64 drafts because the way the event was structured is... Six main event drafts and then best records made it into top 64, which was eight eight player drafts of eight separate cubes. And the winners of those drafts then made it to the top eight draft. And like you said, you, Reed Duke, Sam Black, a lot of the big names sort of fell out in that top 64. And the top eight was maybe some names people are not as familiar with. But one of those names was our local Allison. So shout out to Allison for uh, for crushing everybody. Spike and cube drafts. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to know from your perspective, Dom. You've played a lot of constructive. You've played a lot of limited. You've played a lot of competitive magic. Now you have played, I guess this is probably as competitive as cube more broadly gets, right? Like the one thing we were saying leading up to this event is that you can watch really good players stream themselves playing magic online, playing like the vintage cube or whatever, or the arena cube. In that case, they're mostly playing against whatever randoms they get paired against. And they're always playing those specific set of cubes. This is really the only time that I'm aware of that, you know, you could have you, Sam Black, Reed Duke, these big names drafting cubes that are of the design of normal people, right? Like just regular cube designers. Now that you've played in this event, I'm curious to know what you think, what, what the set of skills looks like to draft a variety of cubes successfully and how that differs from the set of skills it takes to be a good constructed magic player or a good like a retail limited magic player. Yeah, that there really isn't much in the way of official competitive cube. Uh, you have the the Magic Online Championship series uh, every quarter, I guess, which does have uh, the Magic Online Vintage Cube often as a a core part of that. And funnily enough, if you go back to Worlds uh, 2012, before it was even called Worlds again, it, they just right. had some totally different branding at the time. There was uh, Vintage Cube as it existed then as one of the formats that you got to see the John Fingles of the world and a very young Reed Duke, I believe, take their, their skills to. But that cube, just given everything that's changed since then, that itself looks unrecognizable now. And for you could sure. almost put that in for next year as one of these nostalgic throwback cubes just to <laughs> uh, do that side by side and see uh, how, how far things have come. But um, I, I think that as someone who primarily plays Constructed and has struggled when I've had to delve into Limited for things like the Pro Tour and, and really take that seriously, for me... Whenever a limited format often gets described as, well, it's really like a low-powered cube, those are the types of format that I feel more at home in versus the more superficially simpler bread-and-butter combat math and and so on kind of cubes. That's really not my wheelhouse. Whereas if it's more creative, more high-powered, and there's more room to just do weird stuff, then that that really speaks my language. And so coming at it from the other direction, if a cube lets you do weird things, I'm going to... It will certainly pique my interest, and then we'll see if I can... uh, translate that into success in practice but from that standpoint it's the lower powered cubes that almost scare me more so the regular cube which uh, Anthony's baby which 
heard only very good things about over the weekend that in some ways is more intimidating to me than something like the cascade cube or the changing cube or some of these other very creative concepts which i think just neutrally in the dark these are the ones that might scare people off that's a challenge that i want to tackle and part of the beauty of kubecon is whatever your goal for the event is you can make these choices towards uh, embracing that goal and realizing that goal uh, and you might have more agency in that sense than you have for basically any other magic event I know that yeah. one theme I really drove home hard uh, in my last episode here uh, over a year ago was that uh, I think Cube is this great venue for self-expression. And I think Magic generally, like it, it's unique selling point over all of the other games in that space. Uh, and part of it is the longevity there, just giving you those options is it's such a great means of self-expression. I think Cube is the best format in Magic for that. And I think Cube Con did a great job of showcasing just how wide that potential is. And so, yeah, I mean, if you, if you ask me in broad terms, why was it such a great event? That That's the elevator pitch I would give you. And you mentioned limited formats that people describe as being like Cube. Is that stuff like the Brothers War? Like, what are some recent limited formats that people have described that way? I would say March of the Machine would be a great candidate, right, right. not just for recency saying. bias. Yeah. But, but also, yeah, you have this uh, weird collation where the, the bonus sheet introduced a lot of the, these really powerful cards into the format. You had a lot more powerful rares than you have, even in the typical limited set, uh, to use the usual like limited content vernacular there. This is much more of a Prince format than a Pauper format. And that it felt very uh, swingy in that sense. And there's a lot of cool stuff that's possible, but you have to be prepared to lose to your opponents, uh, Sunfall or Breach the Multiverse or whatever it is. But versus some of the more kind of a low-key limited formats, if you like, where there's less of a range of cool things you can do, but you can just do the normal limited thing and not feel quite as uh, embarrassed about it. So what do you think then gives you an edge in an event like this? Does it come down to things like card evaluation and like drafting well? Do you think it comes down to like purely just not missing in-game mistakes and like doing punts when you're actually down to the actual gameplay like where do you feel like your strengths actually like allowed you to rise above the competition i think there's some amount of all of that if you asked uh reed duke who was i uh, just dominating the event for for most of it except when he physically couldn't be in the room because he had to be on a panel somewhere because he is one of those legitimate a-tier magic celebrities yeah uh, i'm gonna go ahead his and claim answer, that uh, i i got the reed duke's one match loss by him coming to my panel <laughs> yeah we've been giving anthony credit for that all weekend well, well that was a, a great storyline from my perspective actually because when i was looking for people to stay with for kubecon i hadn't organized anything yet it was getting a little close to the deadline for my liking so uh, i put out the call in the official server and this guy did didn't know Lincoln just hit me up saying hey we got a spot on our couch you can crash with us and that entire group was a, a joy to to get to meet and, and stay with but coming into his last draft of day two he had to 3-0 to potentially make top 64 and it turns out he picked the uh, the cube that was uh streamed uh, at the end of day two and to get there to get that 3-0 he had to go through who else reduke in the final round and so he was able to beat reduke on camera give him Maybe his only like official loss at that point uh, on the weekend. Yeah, that was his only official loss so far. And got 65th. But it turns out one person couldn't make the top 64. So Lincoln snuck in and another guy staying with us who was in 66th and came there early with us on Sunday just in case two people uh, made it in. He was left on the outside looking in as, as the odd man out. So uh, a very strange uh, ending to that storyline for him uh, and for me as well. But yeah, someone like Reed he would probably give you an answer that focused a lot more on the fundamentals. So he is very good at just making those in-game decisions, not making those mistakes, which to him, those would be obvious mistakes. But for a lot of the rest of us uh, here on planet Earth, those would be the tough strategic decisions that we have to to weigh up if we're even aware that there are that there's a decision to be made there at all and that's that's another angle is do you know what you don't know and then once you know that can you actually figure it out and what uh, solving one stage of that process doesn't necessarily lead to having an easier time with the other one um, but for him he was able to just play good fundamental magic and that's really all you need to do sometimes for me i think that i can look at some of these weird concepts with format these weird rule changes and have a decent grasp without needing to play a, a ton of drafts or a ton of games I, I can have a sense of what that's going to mean in practice and then hopefully will be better than the average player at uh, following through on the fundamentals even if I i'm going to be a lot sloppier than reduke or someone like sam black who maybe straddles that divide in terms of is known as this very creative deck builder and drafter and for very good reason, but also has that like elite tier grasp of the fundamentals too. Yeah, I, I did notice that when I did catch wind of what we Reed was drafting in different cubes over the weekend, it was largely like very down the middle. Like he drafted a ton of aggro, it seemed like over the course of the weekend. And 
I, almost like just very fundamental decks in terms of just like maybe kind of ignoring some of the cuter or more grandiose synergies the cube designer may have baked in in favor of just playing things with power and toughness and getting his opponent dead, which I think works really well when you're Reed Duke and you're not going to make those mistakes. I mean, I was on commentary in that match you mentioned against Lincoln Davidson, which was of Anthony's regular cube, and watching Reed navigate that draft and then navigate those matches and be in a lot of spots where I think a lot of other players would have scooped or would have not found an out and just watch him methodically go through and like do what pro players of his caliber do, which is make the correct decision repeatedly over and over again. Frankly, I mean, I, I observed a lot of matches, both on commentary and not on commentary this weekend. And, you know, no shade to anybody else that was at KubeCon, but you can catch a lot of punts just by watching a couple matches because people are playing with unfamiliar cards, right? And especially if you're on coverage, you're playing under high pressure situations, like easy to punt a lot at an event like this. And I think a big part of the skill that a player like Reed Duke brings to the table is just simply not doing that. Um, I, I've said a bunch of times before that I think Magic is actually kind of like a, a shit spectator sport for the most part, because being really good at Magic is actually just making very few mistakes for like nine hours straight. <laughs> like that is the skill of being good at Magic, and that doesn't really translate to like exciting moments on coverage or whatever. But yeah, I think that ability to just be consistent and make the right decision as many times as possible, like really showed up over the course of the weekend for the players that were able to do that. But it's interesting that you feel like your advantage was largely in digesting these cube formats and how you've never played any of the cubes you drafted this weekend before correct these were all new environments to you i guess except for my bun magic cube <laughs> aside from the bun magic cube which uh I, I and i know people react poorly when you do this i 3 would the, the team draft the grudge match against uh, wisconsin on behalf of england on the thursday in the bun magic cube uh, but my teammates were, were not so lucky unfortunately but uh so wisconsin took the day overall but yeah had, had drafted that before felt pretty comfortable with it uh drafted it again there and then also that was my choice going into the top 64 uh, of which of the cubes i wanted to focus on there and that cube's presence in the event really highlights just how much flexibility there was for the people there at every level. So if you trust in your ability to just play good, honest fundamentals, good, honest magic, then the Bud Magic Cube is ideal for that. Whereas if you're someone who you you look at this strange Rube Goldberg machine and you can instantly fi uh, figure out how these different cogs fit together, well, then you have the Build Around Cube and the Creative Cube and maybe even something like the Cascade Cube where just you're not really playing magic anymore, even you're playing this magic adjacent game, but can you use these, these heuristics that you've built up through years of playing high level magic can you transfer those over and figure out okay well, in this new game what am i meant to be doing there which is interesting for me because typically i have a lot of magic specific experience and skills which i don't think actually carry over that well so when i've tried dabbling in you know hearthstone or one piece or whatever the, the new tcg of, of the day is i find that i often look and feel very amateurish because i I don't have the, that transferable skill set, maybe, where I can just be at a, at a high baseline level in any game I play. Likewise, I, you know, Sam Black is a very avid board gamer, right? So if you put him in, in this new complex uh, Euro board game that he's never played before, he's still going to find his feet pretty quickly and figure out on the fly what he's meant to be doing. I'm going to look like I've never you know, played a board game before in my life. So the fact that I, I can maybe jump to these these different concepts. It's it's close enough to regular magic that I can do that. I guess is the point, right? If it if, if it uh, goes completely uh, off the rails, then uh, maybe I'd be as lost as anybody else. Yeah, I mean the Cascade Cube you mentioned uh, by our friend Zach Barish is particularly I find it particularly challenging. So this is an environment that is a rules modification. Everybody essentially starts with a Maelstrom Nexus in play, which gives the first spell you cast each turn Cascade. Plus there are a lot of interesting and complex card choices that just, you know, tweak what uh, the mana cost of a card is in a lot of interesting ways. I've just found this this cube to not really play like I expected and just be like a really, really difficult puzzle to solve. How did you actually manage to look at that and, and figure out what was going on and like shortcut to a reasonable strategy? I wasn't sure that I had necessarily. So coming out of the draft portion, I wasn't sure if my deck was uh, was great or just completely non-functional in the sense of it might not actually be able to win a game. And that's a... I, I, uh, I can relate to that feeling. <laughs> the first relatable thing a, you said the whole episode, Dom. <laughs> yeah, and that, that, that's a refreshingly dangerous kind of confusion to have coming out of a, of a draft Refreshingly dangerous confusion, um, I love it. So, so there's stuff which, when you think about the implications, jumps out pretty quickly. So for example, uh, instants get a lot better because if you can only cascade once per turn, well, you break that restriction by cascading on the opponent's turn uh, as well. Any kind of free spell, uh, like the, the evoke elementals, or that there's a lot of options in that space once you, you build the cube with those in mind, uh, those become a lot better. And so the, the overlap there of 
three instance, those are just some of the best cards in the queue by default, I think, even if the effect that they have is not especially inspiring. So my deck ended up with uh, Once Upon a Time, Endurance, and Force of Vigor, and I had this interesting choice in the deadboarding portion of, am I meant to main deck this Force of Vigor, even though I couldn't actually remember how many strong artifacts and enchantments there were in the cube, just because getting to cast a free instant on my opponent's turn that's technically a four drop and could therefore cascade into a three drop a two drop uh, anything in in, uh, in that register that's a very powerful effect and then once you get down to something like once upon a time which is just a broken card in general but also even more broken in this <laughs> very strange way yeah given the exact requirement in place well you know that's a card you're going to heavily prioritize coming in i also uh, i think it's no no surprise in in that cube that cards like uh soul talisman so this is the the soul ring the call zero has to spend uh not going to see that one ever in constructed but in the cascade cube this is a absolute premium card i mean you're, you're thrilled yep. to have this in your deck but then i i see a mox opal and i think well if i can reliably have two good zeros to cascade into with all of my ones and enough of those ones are artifacts, which it turns out they are in this cube, well, then I can quite reliably have four mana, five mana going into turn two, turn three, and then anything big that I draft, I can get full value out of. And so I ended up in this weird uh, green-based artifacts deck, which, talking to Zach afterwards, is not an archetype which he was aware existed in the cube, or one that he tried to support. And I'm not going to say that I innovated some new archetype. I just kind of scraped together what I could, given the context of the draft, where I felt very lost in real time. But just having this framework for what does this restriction mean? How do I want to build decks in general? And how do I marry those two? Meant that I could wade into these very deep, very dangerous waters and, and actually cobble together something that uh, that ended up uh, 3 airing the draft there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you bring up sort of the, the difference in your interest and ability in board games. And that kind of makes sense that, you know, a board game is still about like learning a new rule system and figuring out how to navigate uh, resources and things like that. But what you're really saying is you can draw on your vast knowledge and experience in magic by just saying like, what is different here and how can I explore? Like, what is going to be most impacted by that rules change and focus in on that and then figure out, you know, how that's going to impact uh, just sort of the power level of these cards. Yeah, and I think the semi-casual, semi-competitive vibe of KubeCon was the perfect venue to explore cubes like that, where if it's too competitive a setting, like let's say one of these cubes was the limited format for a GP or a Pro Tour or something like that, if there is some imbalance or some exploit that you can identify... That can be a great story in its own right. You know, if someone does crack the code for a limited format, that's something that you, you still hear about many years later on. But the the danger there, uh, in the sense of just the format feeling ruined by that, is a lot higher. Whereas also, if it's too casual of an environment, you don't have the people looking for those opportunities to do something outside the box or, or get an edge necessarily. And so I, this was the perfect opportunity for, I'm not going to put myself in the same rarefied air as someone like Sam Black, but for people who want to approach this as a puzzle to be solved in a creative way, this was, I think, the exactly the right vibe for the event to have uh, to allow that to happen. Yeah. And, I, you know, I appreciate the humility, but I think if we can, you know, just look at the distance between you and Sam Black and you and the rest of the attendees of KubeCon, I think you're certainly closer to the former than, uh, than the latter. So give yourself a little bit of credit there. I did think it was interesting to see the ways that the really skilled players drafted over the weekend, right? Like, I mean, Sam has a bit of a reputation for playing three to five colors in pretty much any format that you give him cards in and what i saw over the weekend this remained true right in all of the cubes he drafted and because sam is so good at playing that kind of deck like it's almost like sam black can sit down and just force a sam black deck in almost any cube and have success because that is what he's so good at and kind of similarly like i said reed was playing a lot of kind of very fundamental like aggro creature power and toughness decks right that weren't trying to do anything like cute or synergistic, just trying to get his opponent dead, and that worked really well for him. Is there like a a tone to the kinds of decks you felt like you were drafting that would describe your weekend overall, or do you feel like you were all over the place? So just building on that quickly, uh, one funny story from the weekend was uh, once we were done cubing, we tried something that's called Duplicate Sealed, which is in a similar space of sorts to cube, but the the premise there is that uh, you have this curated pool of however many cards, and your team has to build three decks from that pool, and then you battle against the other team who is building from the same pool, and uh, and from there it's, it's a normal team draft. And so the owner of this sealed box, uh, Lan Ho, he had put together this 
pretty interesting range of possible strategies. So you had the the entry level stuff like uh, the mono red deck, the mono white deck, which is uh, very easy and, and natural to build. But then you had these ram decks, all of uh, gold cards that might pull you in this direction or the other. And then Sam was able to rifle through the box, see the field of the dead, and immediately just get to work. And so. Uh, if you know Sam, he's well known for loving these almost deck builder game style decks where yeah. you get to recycle and rebuild your deck over time and just loop certain cards and you're almost training your deck to become more optimized with the things that you care about. And so this card that you played on turn five or six is going to show up again on turn 17, turn 18 because you've shuffled it back in somehow and you've extended the game to the point where you will find that card again and it's going to be much more relevant there in context. And so in this box, which contained two copies of Guy's Blessing, two copies of Devious Cover-Up, uh, the counter spell that also shuffles some cards back from your graveyard, and an elixir of immortality <laughs> alongside a trading post, he was able to build three distinct decks that all are just the ideal Sam Black deck, like the platonic ideal of a Sam Black deck in whatever format he's playing. The box allowed him to build three of those, and uh, Land said afterwards, he, he wasn't aware that the first of those was possible, let alone the, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the full platter that, that Sam came up with. But So whether that's a failure of design in one sense or a resounding success in the sense of someone got to do the thing that he wanted in triplicate in a way that you weren't even aware of you you can debate whether that's a success or failure philosophically but uh, that, that was just a good showcase of if you have a, a reputation if you like if you're, you are known for a certain deck style then you could almost pick the cubes in the event that let you target that or just within a cube that was large and expansive enough find a way to make that happen regardless so for me if you look at the decks i drafted some of them were i guess you could say i trended towards the synergistic decks rather than the good stuff decks where possible but then you had for example when i drafted your cube this is a cube which very explicitly wants you to be doing the mostly generic mostly uh stable and predictable things and so I can try and build around the, the Hogak that's in the, the, the cube or whatever, but maybe with mixed or uncertain results. Or I could just lean into what you would prefer I do for the most part and just play Honest Magic, which I'm also fine with doing. And I quite like both of the decks I ended up with. E even if uh, going back and listening to your commentary of my draft, maybe we would have gone in quite different uh, directions there. <laughs> I don't know if we've gone in quite different directions. There's a couple of picks that I, uh, I thought were, were interesting for <laughs> sure. Oh my goodness. Mm. Uro still in the pack. Now that's an on-color Titan in addition to Titania, Protector of Argoth. That's Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. And it looks like Titania is the pick. Leaving Uro for, uh, for somebody else. That's going to be a late Uro there. Now we see Explore and Dig Through Time pulled to the front of this pack, it looks like. I'd be surprised to see Dom take an Explore here, to be honest. Unless he's brewing something that I, I can't imagine. I, I think he took the Explorer, unless, uh, unless cards got shuffled around in a way that I couldn't see. It seems like Dom took Explorer there. Do you which, think that's a safe pick? You know, it's still on color. Uh, that's a card that I don't think is uh, among the power level you'd expect to see taken fifth pick, I think we're on right now. Uh, it seems like uh, something you want to get much later on if you're going to be the green deck. I'm curious. So I have questions about my cube. I'm going to be selfish here and ask you questions about your perspective on the Button Magic cube. First, with regards to the team draft, and we'll post the um, link to the NRG VOD in the show description. I think it's only going to be live for a couple other weeks, though, and then eventually it'll be on YouTube. So that link, if you're listening to this in the future, might not still be live, but you can find this on YouTube. Did you come into that draft, the team draft of my cube, with intent to force green, or were you actually just drafting the hard way and felt like the green cards were always the best options at each, at each juncture? I took your statement uh, in your your cube uh, breakdown episode about how, well, there are a smattering of four drops and five drops and six drops, but you really got to be careful how many of those you have in your deck. I took that as a personal affront and as a challenge, and I was determined to, to shove as many of those into my deck at the same time as I could. But what actually happened was, yeah, I went in there with an open mind, um, and I think you, you've done a great job of setting up this environment where those basic principles are in play across the various colors and color combinations and decks that you can build and even though the mid-rangey creature focused green white deck is going to feel quite different from the spell focused spell heavy blue red deck if you think about the context they exist in it makes sense that they would be coexisting in harmony in the same cube together but based on i, I think what i think uh deemed to be true about the cube and also the way that you broke it down yourself to me there's actually this relative advantage to the bigger but and maybe stickier cards like a seeker's chariot and some of the five drops and the six drops because there is enough 
uh, cheap stuff to keep pace and to break serve that you very rarely are going to end up just not playing magic because right. you uh, you have too many of these clunkers in your hand to start a game. Like they're just mathematically are not enough in there for that to be possible. Even if you had uh, them all, you would still have plenty of two and three drops because there's just it's impossible to draft so many heavy top end cards that you're literally doing nothing until late in the game. Exactly, and you have enough cheap removal and cheap card filtering, and these these creatures which are good on offense but also good on defense. That it is quite hard not to survive until the point where you can start trying to go over the top unless the opponent has you know a very good draw with a a fast proactive deck and so i was prioritizing the card like uh, seeker's chariot uh, the wandering emperor uh, to fairy temporal pilgrim if i ended up in some kind of blue deck um and then even lower down the curve the cards that offered that benefit while also being those cheap threats so uh, my top 64 draft i opened bitter blossom and got past fable of the mirror breaker and both of those really fit the bill there for me of yeah. you know these are going to shrug off the the one for on removal and if i can get the game to the point where we're just trading off cards if i'm the one with this thing left over then that's really going to put me far ahead but then just in general these are great cards to cast on turn two turn three absent any other context and then yeah the the stuff like chariot is going to be more conditional in that regard but i almost feel like those are more unique in the context of the cube than the uh, the good uh two drops and some of the cheap removal spells but i i can get enough of those to kind of uh, stay in the mix but then these give me this guaranteed payoff to almost orient the game towards but i know i'm going to come out ahead yeah i think i remember a few of your picks specifically pack one pick one you started on a seeker's chariot over lightning bolt which is certainly in line with what you're describing right here you're like look is lightning bolt the best cheap red removal spell yes it is but i'm going to be able to pick up tar fire or shock or pyrite's bell bomb or whatever fire bolt and those are all good enough that they are closer to that makes lightning bolt closer to replaceable but chariot is pretty singular in terms of what it does at four mana across the entire cube so anyway i'm not sure i got a clear answer to your question so you weren't forcing green you were forcing high-end curve stuff which happened to be in green is that how you describe your draft I do seem to end up in green in your cube a lot, uh, as you identified. I essentially three just out of three drafted times. the same deck that I that I drafted back when uh, we drafted in person in Baltimore. In the top sixty four, I did end up in this Ragdos deck with a very light smidge of green, and even that, I'm not sure if embracing that splash was was correct. Even, but yeah, I, I just try to stay open but then my approach to the cube just naturally led me down that path whereas i think it would be perfectly reasonable to take the lightning bolt there and then maybe that person would have been dragged towards some blue red spells deck or some black red mid-range deck like the, the kind that i drafted later but yeah there, there's a certain path dependency if you like where i took the chariot and so that's going to determine everything else about the rest of the draft even though part of the reason i, I like the chariot is that it is splashable at the point where I'm generally happy splashing a card. So in my right. black red deck, I can splash chariot by turn four. If I pick up enough fixing, I'm probably going to be able to cast it by then. Whereas the the relative advantage of Bolt being a one drop, if I'm trying to splash that in some kind of a Domain Control deck, let's say, there's no guarantee that I can cast it on one if I need to, or even on turn three or turn four if I'm having to fetch some tap land or, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't see your full deck list. I saw a little bit of your deck from Top 64. I know you were splashing green for Grist. What other green cards were you playing in that deck? Do you remember off the top of your head? Yeah, I had a Renner 6, and then I also had the one half or one fraction, if you like, of Questing Druid. Right, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I did see the Questing Druid. And so there, you know, if I was against some, like the the Blue Eye Control deck that knocked me out, I wanted access to all of those heavy hitters, and I was going to make my mana base much more painful in order to do that if i was against the the mono red deck or there was a, a pretty scary blue red spell deck in that pod as well yeah. then i probably would just cut all of the the stomping grounds and the overgrown tombs that i need to enable that just keep it pretty simple in pure black red and with my three fetches maybe work in one of those jewels in case i need to cast the other half of cresting to it but keep it keep it very minimal there yeah and then i knew that you were drafting the bun magic you were top 64 but i didn't realize you had said earlier on this episode that that was actually your, your first choice you chose to draft that i'm curious given your description of your relative strengths as a player being like being able to unpack these more complicated environments figure out more synergistic and complex kind of card interaction environments why then did you choose to draft the bun magic cube for top 64 which as you point out is like a much closer to like a fair magic do the normal expected thing kind of environment and kind of surprisingly the cascade cube was one of the options in the top 64 yeah that was an interesting choice but i didn't hear anybody complaining about it no i that was uh, my second choice in fact i i stayed away because even 
having a draft's worth of experience under my belt at this point, I still didn't feel completely confident in in what was going on there. Sure, so still the biggest unknown, even if it was a thing that you felt like you could exploit. Yes, and I knew Theo was going to be in there, and Theo did <laughs> uh, feel like he he understood uh, the Cascade Cube. So try to try to stay out uh, stay out of those shark infested waters for the time being. And most of the other cubes that you could choose between were more sensible, if you like, than a lot of the cubes that I made a point of trying to draft in in the earlier days. So you didn't have the changing cube, for example. You didn't have some of these rule adjustment cubes other than the cascade cubes it was a lot of uh you know there was uh, emma's peasant cube and there, there was the 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 data generated vintage cube a lot of stuff which is within more of the the mainstream cube expectation and so given that well i i went with what i thought was the best version of that and certainly the one that i had the most experience with myself and you know i, I would feel happy squaring off against even you know the the, the tougher opponents in the top 64 in bond magic than i would in most of those other cubes and to so, be fair at that point you were also six and oh in matches lifetime in the bond magic cube so pretty good record to be going into the top 64 with yes yeah, so i have now b- besmirched out with a single loss but i'll, I'll be back I'll, I'll try and redeem myself at some point <laughs> so you kind of approach the event like you would an investment retirement plan where you started with high risk high reward uh cubes and then kind of focused in on something more reliable and that you felt like you were just more confident as a baseline on at the end well, well, this was a tough decision in its own right, and I'm so glad that this event let me make that decision. So going in, I had uh, an inkling about the changing cube, and there might be this this way to exploit the way it was set up, uh, which, if I was right about that, and I could draft that strategy, would lead to great results. And so I wanted to put that to the test as soon as I could. So that was my, my top pick going into the first draft of day one. Uh, and sure enough, I, I'm in that cube. Uh, my intuition was correct. I'm able to force this incredibly fun and incredibly broken uh, Black Red uh, Sacrifice deck. And so once I've done that, I, I now have a further choice. Do I camp out here in the changing cube, try and do this again, uh, ha- keep having my fun uh, uh, in this format, and then maybe see what else there is? You know, once I've moved the metagame to that point, uh, maybe other people catch on, or maybe there's some other uh, deck that emerges once I have more experience there or do I think well I've had my fun now I can spread my wings and go and try some of these other cubes that I've heard so so many good things about and then maybe circle back to this if there's time uh, towards uh, the end of the event and that's a kind of flexibility which you really don't have if you're going to uh, either a constructed or a limited event which is yeah. a single format I think it's a much better form of flexibility than you have even at something like a command fest which might be the the closest analog to this in terms of the overall vibe and the type of crowd it attracts but there's a a level of freedom to opting into what you know will be a shared experience to a point and maybe you can uh find a unique strategy which other people are not aware of but you are signing up for the same thing that the other people are signing up for and you don't have to worry about well even though I think my deck is a 7 out of 10, what if the table disagrees? What if their oh, decks yeah. are higher or lower? And you, you don't need to have any kind of pre-game or rule zero conversation. And just, just knowing that means, you know, if you are uh, able to uh, solve the puzzle and figure out how to break this cube, well, you get a, a round of applause for doing that. And all the blame is directed at the cube uh, designer or owner rather than at you for bringing your you know, your broken combo deck to the to the kiddie pool. Or blame the table for letting you get that. Yeah, fair. <laughs> yes, that's it. Which is what the cube designer will do as soon as you point the finger at them. They'll be like, well, why didn't you simply draft that deck as well? It's it's all on your fault. So we're talking about sort of this variety of the different cubes at this event, which I agree is one of the, the great things about it, that really you can find something no matter what, what kind of experience you're looking for. And even like what kind of experience you're looking for, depending on the time of day. I was definitely getting tired in the, the last, last draft of the evening and did not want to do something super complex for those. But I'm curious, how did you actually sort of approach and evaluate the different cubes and figure out what actual kind of gameplay experience you felt like you could expect from them? So uh, not not to uh, talk about Sam too much, but if you go back and listen to his uh, quite general episode of Cube uh, on his podcast from a while back, one of the things he says is, it's almost less productive to ask the cube designer what archetypes they want to support versus just looking at the list trying to identify the top 20, top 30 cards just based on power level, and then extrapolating from that how the cube is is going to play out. And so w- one example there would be the the Uber Bear Artifact Cube, which was uh, towards the bottom of my list of cubes that I wanted to be in, but there was some, some weirdness with the algorithm uh, at some point on day one, I think, that a lot of people kind of got scrambled and shifted around. So I end up in this cube, and as I'm just like frantically looking over the list, there's a lot of what you would expect from any given artifact cube, but also some cards which 
stand out in the sense of I'm not sure why they're here as opposed to you know in a more mainstream cube instead so my pack one pick one in that draft was foam host sea shark and that's a card which you expect to see in an artifact cube it makes artifacts I, and those artifacts even have counters so the the counters modular stuff interacts with those too so yeah makes sense that this will be here it's going to be one of the best cards but in your artifact cube this is a good thing to have to be one of the best cards but then my pack one pick two is mystic confluence and this is a card which is going to be one of the best cards in almost any cube that it's in and in a theme cube which often by definition will be a little bit lower power because you're shutting off access to a lot of the generically good cards if one of those generically good cards sneaks its way in well it has the potential to just be the best thing in a way that is this distraction from the cube is meant to be about so i see that and to me its presence there is a sign that there will be more cards like this which shouldn't really have slipped through the net in that way and so i'm going to draft this good blue control deck which ah, notionally gestures towards artifacts you know I, ha- I have a trading post and uh you know one of my removal spells is a executioner's capsule instead of just a, a doom blade or something right but it's going to make sense for me to just take the good cards and build a deck which would look normal in any other cube instead of doing the cool artifact thing which i want to be doing you know when i've built artifact cubes or played them myself this is what i want to be focusing on but if you're quite explicitly signaling that I should be doing this instead, even if that's not what you think you're telling me, then I'm just going to do that. Yeah, I love how you're sort of talking about informing your decision incrementally with every pack that you look at and sort of using that signal of, this card is kind of a surprise here, you didn't expect to see it, but maybe that means there will be other things that are similar. And that doesn't necessarily mean other things that are similar in terms of, you know, being a big five mana counter spell, but similar in terms of it deviates from uh, sort of what you expected. And so you might find other other deviations that are similar uh, down the line in the next couple of packs. Yeah, I, so there, there are other ways that these themed cubes can fail as well. So I'd heard that the iteration of this cube that was there last year, Zach Hill had very easily cruised to a trophy in his pod by just drafting all of the good shatter effects. And it turns out that uh, the cards which just blow up artifacts, they maybe are narrow in the sense that they don't do anything else. But if that's the only thing you care about, they're really, really good at doing that. And so he ended up drafting this John deck full of uh, pest infestations and all of these other super powerful artifact removal spells and if that is the best thing to be doing then i do think something has gone wrong there and in artifact heard- heavy draft format so scars of modin came to mind one of the emergent strategies towards the end of that format was this uh red green dinosaurs deck if you like that was just the the big chunky uh green creatures the good green cards that blow up artifacts and because your finishers couldn't be naturalized or shattered themselves right. well they had this resilience that uh, a you know six mana five five artifact flyer would not have and so they, they had patched that uh, flaw in in the previous design but maybe not remove some of the generically good cards which were out of place but for a very different reason yeah i heard from uh from zach barish who drafted that cube that they were still he said he drafted basically five color, destroy all artifacts, and had a perfectly good time and like kill people with mill basically just by <laughs> having. Uh, what was the one card he had? That's, that's incredibly rude, is how I would describe that. <laughs> yeah, I figured the one card he had to was was he looping Mystic Sanctuary? He had some way where he was like not going to die to mill and was basically like, yeah, I'll just stop my opponent's decks for doing everything they can in this cube. I think theme cubes like that are really hard. I've never designed a cube of that sort of strong a theme before, and I wonder how much the meta has to sort of reevaluate, right? Like, kind of like you mentioned, that, that, that deck in Scars of Mirrodin, once everyone realized that artifacts are everywhere, you're all supposed to play naturalizes, then eventually there was this realization, well, if everyone's playing naturalizes, let's play threats that can't be naturalized, even if when you first look at a pack, the most powerful things seem like this cool artifact creature actually this like random three four in that's not an artifact is better because of this sort of unfolding meta thing i wonder how much any cube in this event really has an opportunity to have that sort of like feedback loop of this turns out to be really good then people actually change their draft strategy and you know if there would be a deck in the uber artifact cube that was non-artifact creatures that was really good that wasn't just you know playing reclamation sages and i don't know we don't have a great answer to that I, i should say too I'm really excited to get my hands on the uh, the data. So, I mean, a peek behind the curtain. Last year at KubeCon, we actually had to register draft pools like on paper. So after the draft, they would give every player a checklist. You'd pass your pool to the person across from you. You would check off every single card they drafted. It was really time consuming. Uh, they were being very thorough, obviously, to make sure that uh, you know everything was accounted for, which was great and necessary. 
This year, Gwen Decker of Cube Cobra, who builds the software that runs this event, has added a much better way to handle this, which is basically just that you upload a picture of your draft pool at the beginning and at the end of the draft. So you have a check-in, check-out photo, which is way faster uh, and, uh, and really helpful. And we, the cube designers, are going to get these deck photos, these pool photos, at least I should say. I think the pool photo was required. The deck list photo itself was not required, so not as many people will have uploaded the built deck. But we're going to get photos of the pools with the associated records in that draft. And I'm really eager to see what the winningest decks in the Bun Magic Cube looked like over the weekend because I was trying to pay attention a little bit as things were going on. I'd pop by the pod every once in a while and see what people were drafting. And the first day, I heard like a couple of aggro decks were doing really well, and I was like, ah, it's just like Luris too good in this cube. Is it just going to take over everything? But then as the weekend went on, like I had people come up to me telling me that they drafted five color field of the dead and three owed, or they drafted a sick blue red spells deck and three owed. So I'm really curious to see what that diversity actually looks like, and I'm sure that uh, you know Uber Bear or anybody else designing one of these more thematic cubes will be in a similar position where you get this very interesting perspective from a totally different set of players, right? Like we all have our local play groups and. That has its own sort of incestuous meta that may be really good at revealing some flaws of a design and just completely miss others because of the biases of those players. Absolutely. It's a great way to get a an outside look on your cube. Uh, but it, again, it's, it's a balance of you have players who are competitive and will take this problem seriously, but not in the sense that that's going to override everything else. And if they see a chance to maybe have some more fun forcing this deck instead, or they, they see this card, which gives them the good brain chemicals from 15 years ago, maybe they're going to take that and go down that line instead. So if there is some kind of imbalance there, it will probably be identified and it's going to be there in the data if you look for it. But maybe in not a way where everyone is going to encounter that in their pod because one person's going to find that and force it and it's going to ruin the experience for everyone else. So it's almost the perfect way to get that perspective, but in a way that won't make people feel like they've wasted their time or had some negative experience in, in, in the meantime. Yeah, and ultimately, we're still talking about really small data sets, right? Like, uh, if your cube was in top 64, you will have had, at most, seven full drafts of it, which, uh, what's that? Seven times eight, math is hard. 56 individual pools and records from the weekend to uh, to look at, which is great. I mean, that's fantastic. It's amazing to have that. But obviously, if we're talking about like, is that going to be definitely showing some statistically significant outlier of this color being overperforming or this one card being overpowered? And the answer is there'll be a ton of noise in that data just based on whether someone got mana screwed or built their deck wrong or whatever. Yeah, I mean, from a designer perspective, though, this is a super, super cool opportunity. Even if, it's a, if it is a small sample size, it's super unique data. I mean, I remember when I started designing regular cube, what was it, some number of years ago, and we would, you know, play it for a while and then discover, oh, nobody's been playing Find Finality, and somebody started playing it, and it turns out to be totally busted, or Mayhem Devil. Like, nobody played Mayhem Devil for three or four drafts until we realized it was just one of the best cards in the cube. And I remember thinking, like, how cool would it be to have my cube in front of, you know, top tier players who would be able to solve this right away? And I mean, honestly, I feel pretty good that uh, they didn't make my cube look stupid. Like they drafted it kind of differently, but in a reasonable way within sort of the, the bounds that I expected, which is just a great thing to see. I thought your cube put on some of the most exciting coverage matches of the entire weekend, bar none, uh, largely because I think a lot of the cubes with more powerful cards whether they admit it in their cube description or not, have a much wider power level band. Mm -hmm. And it's just, yeah, some players draw their Ragavans and their Lightning Bolts, and some players draw their Gaunty Lords of Luxuries and their Soul Herders. And, you know, the players that draw the better cards are going to prevail. And your cube is actually much narrower, I think, in, in what it's doing. And uh, to watch Reed Duke and these other great players navigate those environments, like every match came down to the last, I'm not, spoilers, every match came down to the last game and usually always the last turn cycle where it was like, if you had one more turn, your opponent would have won, but you just barely got there, which was really exciting to see. Yeah, I can give the the word example from the changing cube if if you want a sense of how to find that exploit in the format and then how yeah. to, to really capitalize on that. So looking just at the concept of the cube. So as the name would suggest, every creature in this cube has changeling. So all creatures are all creature types in all zones. Not, uh, that, not so, that he's chosen all changelings, but they've, it's an added rule that it's modifying existing cards. Yes, I don't think there were any actual cards with the printed word changeling on them. And part of that is those cards have to be limited in their power by design because they interact with all of these various uh, creature type uh, payoffs. And when you don't need to have those uh, shackles in place, well, a, a lot of weird stuff gets possible very quickly. So 
if you just think from the ground up, what does that mean for other cards in the cube? Well, it means that the the cards that care about creature type in this obvious way, so your your lords or you you know you uh, you search your library for a creature of this type and do something with it, those cards just automatically uh, get upgraded in a meaningful way. So Trifo Carbinger, for example, this is a green for an O3 when it ETBs, you search your deck for a forest or a tree folk and you put that card on top of your deck. And so in constructed, this is shown up in your Adoran deck or decks which have a specific tree folk that you really care about finding. Right. And here it's a cheap creature and that's important we'll come back to that in a second which either finds you your next land drop or finds any creature in your deck and that is a it's just a much 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 card. better worldly tutor it makes worldly tutor look like trash yeah that, that's a card which if that showed up in modern horizons 3 people would say the sky is falling and these people have no idea what they're doing and that is that kind of upgrade is the typical upgrade that you can expect from that kind of card in this cube so what that means going the other way is that cards that don't explicitly tie into creature type in some way just these generic cards which you need some amount of as the glue that, that ties everything together those cards just get a lot worse and especially if they are uh, just creatures or they're, they're things which you know they're fine cube cards you would pick them in most cube contexts but here given this rapidly rising tide they have been left behind they are fully submerged at this point so i was keen to really deprioritize the kind of stuff which i would prioritize in in most other cubes but then the other thing is that these tribal decks creature type decks these are synergy decks first and foremost and so they tend to be better in uh games that are on the larger side shall we say uh <laughs> you, you want to have just more cardboard to play with and so once you're doing that, your cards can interact and be more than the sum of their parts. And that's just the classic recipe for an elf deck or a goblin deck or, or anything like that. And so if you can find ways to just trade off cards cheaply or reduce the size of the game, or if your deck can do that, but has less of a setup requirement than the other deck doing the same thing, well, that, that's a big advantage that you can capitalize on. And just the average removal spell. So, you know, is human frailty, this is a black instant destroy target human, is that a better removal spell than fatal push? Well, in the abstract, no, but in a cube where every creature is a human, this is one of the best removal spells ever printed. It's the same principle as before. And so, yeah, there's a lot of cards like that once you go looking for them. And now that I have idly started putting together my own changing cube after this experience, turns out like a lot of cards in the early era of magic, very, very good at blowing up walls. You know, in case they ever yes. printed a really <laughs> broken wall, there, there, there were going to be some fail safes in the card pool against yes. that. So, you know, tunnel or there, there's just, the, the list is very long, frankly. And so, you know, you, you're not used to seeing those cards in this context. But when you realize that they just round up to the best removal spells that you've seen, well, already that's a good limited card right but in an environment where you're using creatures and like stacking them together to do these silly things just the value of removal gets better and the removal you have access to is a lot better too so just the colors that have removal by definition are going to be a lot stronger even everything else aside than they would be normally and so uh, black and red naturally fit into into that color scheme uh, and then once you look at what those colors are doing in this cube uh, the, the, a lot of that stuff is also bound up with that too. So a card like, I think it's Death Spore Thalid, one of, one of the Black Thalids, which I, I haven't seen this card or thought about this card since drafting Time Spiral 18 years ago now, but this is uh, one in a black, does the usual Thalid thing, but you can sacrifice a sapling to give it. So... Uh Editing Booth Andy here, some sort of glitch in the matrix. Looking back over Dom's audio file, the audio backup I recorded, I swear Dom said... The rules text of Death Spore Thalid here, which is sacrifice the sapperling, give target creature minus one, minus one to end of turn. But that last bit appears to be missing in all the recordings. Minus one, minus one to end of turn. That's what you give a creature when you sacrifice a sapperling to Death Spore Thalid. Spooky stuff, kids. But you can sacrifice a sapperling to give it... So, uh, thinking, yeah. thinking uh, that through, if their deck relies on... You know, my Priest of Titania tapped for five mana because everything is an elf. Well, if one of the interchangeable cards in my deck just kills every X one on site, that's not going to be possible anymore. And if that in turn is a synergy piece, well, now my deck is doing the thing that you should be doing under this constraint and also is best place to break up whatever they're doing under that constraint as well. And so, yeah, my deck that was full of removal spells attached to creatures, which in turn synergized with all my other creatures, that was a fantastic place to be and, and 3-0'd very easily. So I, I started the draft 
with a pack one pick one Muxus, which was one of the cards I was hoping to open coming in. Uh, if you haven't had the Muxus experience yet, uh, go look this one up on on the show notes. This is uh, quite the wild ride in a goblin deck, and certainly in a cube like this. But that's the kind of card which, if you survive long enough to cast that card, the game is over if you don't brick entirely. Yeah. Um, and it's in the colors. It's basically summon the pack on in this cube, pretty much. <laughs> yes. Uh, and it's in the colors that are best place to use that. And so I, I ended up never drawing or casting my Muxus, but that put me in the lane to be in this, uh, this goblin sacrifice deck, which I think... And once I told people about this formula, some of them did it too, uh, had equally good results. This was just the best thing to be doing by far in this cube. I think it's this, and then there was this elf ball deck with all of the uh, your heritage druid, glimpse of nature stuff, and that is powerful in the abstract, and certainly powerful against other uninteractive creature decks. But this is a really, but really can't interactive be creature deck. Valid. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think my favorite part of of this deck was a. Uh, I had uh, an infinite combo that I didn't even realize because if Kiki Jiki is a goat. Then it turns out that Kiki and Goat Napper <laughs> is just Splinter Twin. Um, and I, I didn't realize this until my opponent, who I had uh, just squeezed the life out of over the course of 10 turns by copying my Goat Napper and stealing his best creature and having him block his other best creature every turn. Just uh, one by and one. Then, and then eventually uh, logged out his draw step with uh, Kiki Jiki and Acquisitions Expert, the, the party uh, ETB yeah, discard creature. That's rude. Event- <laughs> Eventually, when he'd had enough, he just pointed to these two cards and said, you realize you could have just won on the spot, right? And I, I had not realized <laughs> that, in fact. But uh, that, that, so that there was, I don't know if that counts as emergent gameplay or something, but either way, I, I, <laughs> I learned on the fly. And uh, even though I missed important details like that, the basic recipe that I looked at just looking at the list and thinking it through was very easily enough to, to carry the day there. I think that's super insightful about approaching these kinds of like weird rules modification cubes where, you know, we could look at a three mana three three in the Cascade cube and you'd say, wow, this card is now fantastic. This is now an insane card. It's like better than Chardless Agent or look at it in the Turbo Cube and say, this is now a one mana three three. This card is nuts. But that's not really what, what the joke is about. You kind of have to that you actually have to set a new benchmark about what is the most busted thing you can do, you know? It's not about the one mana three three in the turbo cube, it's about the guild globe that is a cantripping wit- ritual. And when you put those two cards next to each other, it's obvious that not everything is scaling the same way. And finding those kinds of things like you're talking about in this changeling cube, finding those things that are really most meaningfully changed by the the context is where you're gonna find success. Yeah, people get really excited about the border posts in the Cascade Cube, and then it's like, oh, you just get a spell force of wield on your turn one, and it's like, oops, now your opponent has a yeah. four drop, right? Like, the uh, the peaks of power in that cube are are really really high, and I think because it is so different than normal Magic, you can get really excited about doing something that is a lot better than you could do in normal Magic, but still <laughs> pretty mid in the Cascade Cube, and uh, trying to figure out which of these modifications are the ones that are truly broken in this new context versus ones that are just broken in the original magic context is probably pretty key to evaluating these novel environments correctly. Yeah, for sure. I didn't get a chance to j- draft the Changeling Cube, but now I'm super interested in it. I mean, I was interested in it before, but I also feel like we should give a shout out to the designer who actually, Donald K. Magic, can we say CubeCon full- champion. Can we say his full name is out? I mean, we could, I mean, it's going to be in the VOD. His name is Great Tim. Point. <laughs> so uh, his name's not actually Donald, <laughs> but uh, Donald K. Magic, uh, Tim won the entire event, CubeCon champion, and, you know, somebody who has done so much for this show in terms of, like, helping us make old card mentions paged and uh, and show notes and annotations. So, you know, I think we proof have... Proofreading things on the site. Proofreading things on the site. Help proofread the poster. I think we have clear evidence here that uh, listening to a lot of Lucky Paper Radio <laughs> makes you win KubeCon. <laughs> that's that's the connection that's people would make very, for very sure. Clear. But, uh, yeah, Tim did a great job over the weekend and uh, crushed everybody in that top eight. So, yeah, we mentioned all the other players. Got to mention Tim, who designed this cube and also took down the entire event. And that's a cube which... Compared to the Artifact Cube, for example, I expect when you have a busted rule modification like the Changeling Cube, silly stuff is going to happen. You're not going to find uh, this perfect sense of balance in a cube like that. And I don't think that should be the goal, honestly. Like, you you understand people are going to be doing silly things. And as long as those silly things roughly bounce off each other enough of the time, then you're in a good place. And if one deck gets a little too pushed, you, you can modify stuff <laughs> every time. gets a little too trick, silly. <laughs> yeah, somebody actually yeah, mentioned like, this to me, that somebody had said to them that the Turbo Cube felt a little bit imbalanced. And they were like, yeah, what, what, do, you, what do you expect? <laughs> 
Right. I mean, we have 30 years of experience designing magic cards, and even that is much easier said than done sometimes. And when you're designing this magic adjacent game with those cards, but where the rules are totally different, of course, uh, something is going to break somewhere. It's, it's only a matter of time. And as I've started putting together my own changing cube now, it turns out you can really target the kind of power level you want. So you could almost have a pauper or peasant changing cube uh, and some of those uncommons are still pretty busted so you got to watch out for them but you can have roughly that kind of power level souped up by the changeling uh, idea or you can go completely berserk i mean if you're willing to not care about power level there's some stuff which is absolutely bonkers and would be even in the the best vintage cubes in that context and so you can choose where on that spectrum you want to target and as long as you do that knowingly and you don't have too wide of a power band within that, then you're okay. Even if, you know, when you get to do the thing, the thing is going to uh, feel pretty silly. Versus the Artifact Cube, which is still playing normal magic, but just with a specific theme to it. If you can't stick the landing with that theme when you're trying to set up this version of normal magic, that to me speaks to a larger design failure than, you know, there needs to be some leeway with the the rules modification cubes so, that, yeah, this is going to go wild. That's what you signed up for. That's what we're trying to give you. So let's all have fun with that. So which direction are you going with your changeling cube that you're you're working on? Right now, I, I'm going to push it as far as I can and maybe try drafting that once and then see how much we need to scale it back. But that first draft, at least, uh, d- depending on your predilections, uh, should be a lot of fun. One of the most fun things about a cube like that is recontextualizing old cards and to find all these ridiculous cards from like Alpha and Antiquities back when walls were extremely common right like people maybe don't realize how many walls were in early magic it was like considered a like foundational part of combat that there would be a lot of walls in the game and yeah it recontextualizing those cards seems like a big part of that fun so i would definitely try it first and then see uh how broken they are before before cutting <laughs> yeah, back that- on it <laughs> When uh, when people talk about magic as Garfield intended, what they don't realize is a lot of it should that have is, a lot of walls. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's cards that just completely disable the game's entire resource system or tell an entire <laughs> color where to go in very loud terms. And then also, there's a lot of back and forth over walls for some reason. Like that, that's the other like major theme going on there. It, people have you know little rose colored glasses for uh, for the history of magic there for sure. All right, what was your favorite cube you played all weekend? We've mentioned, I think, probably most of them you drafted at this point. What was your favorite? I, I got to say the Cascade Cube, just because I, I'd heard so many good things about it coming in, and then over, uh, as well, over the course of the weekend. And I'd been easing myself into that one. I wanted to, ideally, watch some of it play out, or hear some stuff about it from people on the ground, before uh, getting my feet wet there myself. And so that only led to the sense of hype around it building uh, over time. And once I finally sat down to play it, I mean, the, the basic idea is very cool. The implementation, I mean, Zach has put a lot of time and thought into it, but it's just such an offbeat problem to try to solve, both for him and then also for us, you know, the, the people who he's get then giving this problem to. Uh, and yeah, coming out of the draft, thinking, well, my deck does a thing and it's coherent, but I don't know if it's good or if it's just totally awful. That was a really novel experience in its own right. And I, I guess... If it had turned out to be awful, maybe I would have had a less good review myself. But the fact that I was able to actually like see through the fog in the end and my deck got to do its thing often enough and it kind of uh, it worked. It fit together even under this weird paradigm. That was really cool. Uh, so r- really hard to give any other answer than that. And then you know, the I-, I would say one of my favorites was the extracurricular kind of after hours cubing that we got to do. So uh, on Thursday, I played the companion cube. Uh, which uh, Greg Din Rover Horror in various places is you know looking around at these events all the time, and so this cube is one where any spell or any land can be your companion, and it's with the original companion rule, so you don't have to pay the the three mana tax to put it into your hand, and that's another change. Which that sounds incredibly broken because who who knew companions are incredibly <laughs> broken, and it is, but in a way where a lot of it does actually like bounce into each other, cancel each other out, and you you get this really interesting game of magic after that happens but one which is defined from the outset by whatever the uh, companions are and then there's often this metagaming involved over well i know i'm playing against this companion in game one do i actually want to mix up my companion to kind of right. target while that is doing better they can do the same thing and then trying to figure out what must be in the rest of their deck based on that choice of companion is is a fun exercise too so i saw a pack on picks one Mo- mox opal and decided i'm gonna try and force this because if this works, this is a really, really good companion. And if it doesn't, well, that's at least useful feedback that Greg can have to, to carry forward. It turns out it, it is supported. It does work. Uh, so props to him uh, on that. But uh, in each of my matches, 
I switched out my Moxoval for Agatha's Soul Cauldron, which is an absolute banger of a card. Now there's a companion um, card. Yeah, but if, if your deck is well suited to that, and mine certainly was, then that's a great card to have access to in every single game you play. And also had some incidental benefit too, because one of my opponents revealed Recurring Nightmare as their companion before game one. And so if they're going to be doing that, I want to have a companion, which is going to be incidentally hosing their graveyard at the same time. So there was a lot of, of stuff like that, which which really worked. And that's it's a very ambitious concept. There's a lot of work to be done. I'm working on a version of that myself uh, as well that probably is going to go in, in quite a different direction. But just the get, getting to play it was a lot of fun. And then seeing it uh, fundamentally work was the vote of confidence that I needed to embrace that I did myself and, and run with it. Now that I have some more time to think about building even more cubes myself. My hypothesis with, with that cube is I just want to have my companion be either Badlands or Plateau and then just play like an eight land aggro deck. Mm. And that's... That's something which is very possible, and it might even be the best strategy, but you you don't know, right, until you get in there and you try it, and then there's there's those lands which are fine, but then what if that land is, let's say, Plaza of Heroes, Great Hall of the Citadel? What does that let you do in terms of just bridging the color pie, playing the, the best legends from all of these different colors? Uh, what if your land is Windbrisk Heights or Sheldrock Isle, right? Or if it's a Telerian Academy or something even, right? Like you, within that space, there's so many little uh, sub puzzles to figure out. So th- there is so much you can do there. And I'm excited to to dive into that myself. And I think Greg has really taken a, a great first step in that direction. It seems like a really powerful and simple way to unlock just a like really, really deep well of build around potential. You know, I've seen cube designers do the whole draft packages thing with certain cards or like I've seen people do thing where they design like placeholder cards where you can draft this card in the draft and it is one of up to six different cards in deck construction based on whatever one you choose like all these different ways to try and get you more copies or more frequent access to a copy of a card that is important to build your deck around and given that magic has the companion rule it exists this seems like a really elegant way to just like yeah okay fine let's just do that everybody can companion whatever they want and uh and make that work yeah the 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 number of times i have tried to support a theme or an archetype in a cube where there's this one card that is really pivotal to how uh the whole thing functions and i would love it if they had just three identical versions of that card under different names or uh, slightly different conditions, you know, the Kadama's Reach to my Cultivate, if you like, that I could just load up on those and feel okay with it. But then you, you can find these these fixes, so maybe you just break Singleton for that card or you let players draft that card along with some other card. Or right. like, All of those, I think, just lead you down the road to this natural conclusion which this just embraces from the outset. Exactly, and once you yeah. do that, so much else is possible. So shout out to Greg in that queue. I'm excited to see what you do with that concept too dom that's a really cool idea for sure i want to rewind real quick to the cascade cube you mentioned that uh you were talking with other people about it throughout the weekend and i had i was talking to some players about it that were saying that they were surprised it was chosen for top 64 because it was like so high variance because their perception of cascade is that it is like a very high variance mechanic and it is right if you read the mechanic it definitely has a lot of randomness involved in it but having played that cube a few times and i think you could probably attest to this dom I think a huge part of that cube is actually dramatically decreasing the variance of what those Cascade hits can be, right? Like, you put the one copy of Soul Talisman in your deck. Now, every single one drop you ever cast means you're going to get a Soul Talisman on turn one. And so you've turned this thing that is random into this actual, like, very consistent game plan that always involves a Soul Ring or a Black Lotus effectively on the first turn of the game. And then that kind of similarly applies up throughout the curve. So even though it's superficially a high-variance mechanic, I've found that... uh, it to be a very skill rewarding cube and not a cube where you can just RNG into beating someone that's really good at it and really experienced in that environment if you don't really know what's going on. Exactly. Yeah. And I think Theo was correct to assume that he would have a big edge just being Theo, being really good at magic, but also having drafted that cube several times and having got through that initial beautiful sense of confusion about it. Yeah, I think that was a a smart choice for him to make. And there's also, so speaking about interesting like technical decisions and so on, from the organizer side, that question of, what do you put as those top 64 cubes? And then what do you have as that uh, that final top A cube? That itself is uh, an interesting uh, choice where I think you want to have some level of variety, but you also don't want people to be like shifted into a cube, which is totally outside their, their wheelhouse or right. their preferences. And as far as I could tell, I haven't seen under the hood, but the, the algorithm did a pretty good job of holding up in terms of, I don't think anyone at that stage ended up having to play a cube for these... 
I guess higher stakes, even though the stakes there, it, it was much more of a casual vibe. Bragging rights. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or I, I, I don't know, some like 64 pack of Spreckers or something, but um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, a collector's I booster want... of Spreckers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I think you want there to be something like the Cascade Cube. They're for people who want to be that adventurous, but also having stuff like Bun Magic and the Peasant Cube and the regular cube there for the, the more mainstream choices for, for the people at large. And then I, I saw some some grumbling about the the top A cube being the Magic Online Vintage Cube, which I, I'm not a natural sympathizer for that cube myself. I, I don't enjoy it uh, that much. And it, it often is frustrating for me either when people talk about cube, when what they really mean is specifically the Magic Online Vintage Cube, which I know yeah. is a, a, a bugbear of you guys too, or when it's just Vintage Cube season and streamers who I normally love watching are playing this instead of playing their wacky legacy decks or, or whatever. But just, despite all of that, I think that was the most natural choice for uh, the, the top eight cube. It was, I, I think, made sense given the official support that Magic Online was giving the event and the, the presence of you know that, the hashtag Watsy stuff there and so on. And also, we shouldn't forget that even in this room with the highest concentration of cube hipsters that you're going to find in anywhere on the planet until the next KubeCon, the data-generated vintage cube, which was, by definition, the most stock mainstream vintage cube you can get, was routinely the highest choice among people for e each of the drafts on, on both of the days there. So I think that that is a, a, a key thing to have in the event in some capacity, and it makes sense to bypass the question of who gets to be the signature cube at the end and just have that be the natural choice there. But for me, I got to really bookend my KubeCon story in, in the perfect way by drafting the Aqua One Vintage Cube, which uh, I don't know how many people listening have had the privilege of observing or just like looking at this cube, but this is effectively a mostly stock vintage cube. So design-wise, it's you know not doing anything too outlandish, but the level of time and money and care and just aesthetic involvement that has gone into this cube over you know 15 years or more at this point is it's really a sight to behold and it's one of those cubes like the uh, the old border foil cube where just holding the cards has a sense of nostalgia but also trepidation because you're aware of just like how much money and history you're holding in your hands and just getting to play that and you know the the gameplay is what it is for vintage cube my final match of the entire weekend i reanimated my Archon of on turn two, and if I just reanimated my Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger instead, I might have killed my opponent who instead untapped and turn three comboed me, even though he kind of missed the math and ended up losing his Black Lotus for no reason. Like, that, that's the kind of swing that you expect. Yeah. But some part of that was a key thing to have in my weekend, and so getting to close it out in those terms with that cue was the, the perfect ending I could have asked for as well. Yeah, I also saw some grumbling about the magic online cube being the top a cube and you know i agree with what you said that it is the natural choice right like it is the cube everyone knows it's the most iconic cube just from a, a audience perspective that's kind of what most people are going to expect and it sort of provides some continuity and sort of entry point into understanding what this event is all about that it really does seem difficult to justify a different choice yeah i, I you know i was part of the commentary team and we didn't get to decide the top eight cube that was predetermined we got to help decide every other cube basically that was on coverage over the weekend and you know a big part of the coverage is essentially just advertising for the event and having a recognizable cube to viewers which you know cube is fantastic i already talked about how i don't think magic is a great spectator sport and to the degree that it's not a great spectator sport it's even worse when you don't know the cards that are being played so trying to call the cards throughout the entire weekend and have people be able to follow the games when they might not know every single card and every single cube list and you're looking at like a blurry video feed that has like some glare on the sleeves or whatever like there's a lot of really good reasons to have the magic online cube be the top one because it is so recognizable you know for my own personal tastes I would love to use that as an opportunity to highlight anything else about the cube community, right? Like, <laughs> I think this is the difference of whether or not you see KubeCon as this, like, scrappy thing that's striving to be something bigger and better, or whether or not you see it as the pinnacle of the format, right? And if you see it as having already arrived, this is, like, the biggest stage that Cube gets, then I think you want to use that stage for something that furthers your own, you know, agenda within this community. If you see it as not the biggest stage for Cube, but one of the smallest stages for Reed, Duke, and Dom Harvey, then you want it to be something that can appeal to a sort of bigger audience and continue to grow. So, you know, there's all kinds of reasons to do whatever. I think the only justifiable decision that's not the Magic Online Vintage Cube would be having the top eight vote for what they want to play from the weekend. Other than that, you're just kind of like ordaining some other 
semi-random cube as like the most important cube of the weekend which seems very odd and strange to me so so yeah i that's my kind of take on the whole situation and uh my, my whole thing about the vintage cube is that i do think it leads to pound for pound not that interesting games kind of like you mentioned dom like the average game is very often oops my opponent did a broken thing and i guess i lose which you know i think is uh i think the ideal way to watch someone play vintage cube is watching a streamer play it on Magic Online, where you get to hear them talk about their thought process, you get to see them draft the deck, and you get to see if it works. When you're watching from a remove, from a like third-party perspective, it's often kind of like, uh, uh-oh, I guess that game's over because of some weird dumb thing happening. But whatever. Yeah, I, so I, I know LSV has been putting out these uh, daily videos of him team drafting the Alpha Frog Vintage Cube, and yeah. those are the, this, this perfect morsel of Magic content, where you get to watch him do his thing and he's usually trying to do something very goofy very silly he's but trying also to dunk on powerful. his friends in the team draft you know he's it, trying well, to win it, it, but exactly. in a way that they feel bad about it <laughs> right and there i think there is room for like good vintage cube content certainly my reservation is whenever i watch people play these cubes the worst part of it is the power it's the thing that makes the cube a vintage cube as distinct from everything else and the number of times you see people you know see a card that they they want to draft personally in a pack but there's a, a mox pearl there. And so, well, they, they got to take the mox, right? They feel priced into doing that. I actually have more sympathy for stuff like the Time Walks or the Ancestral Recalls because those do a distinct and very powerful thing. They're not and just a worse... You, they're not just a better yeah. land or a worse land when you top deck them. Yeah, and once you know you can do that thing, you can really lean into that. And so, well, now you're, you're finding your Time Walk with your Spellseeker and you're recurring it with all these different things. And, like, you are now a Time Walk deck, whereas there's, there's no mox pearl deck there's just a deck which when it draws mox pearl is going to do its thing a, a turn ahead of schedule and when it doesn't is going to be on a more normal timeline and so it's hard for that card to really lead to better or more memorable gameplay in either direction and instead it's just kind of messing with the basic game engine uh, in this way that i think is pretty unsatisfying yeah but like we said, lots of really good reasons to have it be the uh, the cube at the end of coverage. But, you know, we made a really big attempt on, as the coverage team to make sure that the other seven drafts worth of or eight drafts worth of cubes you can watch. I'm sorry, nine drafts. There's 10 total drafts you can watch on the weekend. The other nine are other cubes that are showcasing a pretty wide variety of what cube can be. So uh, that's only 10 percent of the coverage, right, that was dedicated to the Magic Online Vintage Cube. The rest is all out there stuff and i would highly recommend checking out the regular cube of all the uh, coverage at least i've seen i haven't watched the coverage i wasn't a part of yet i'm gonna go back and watch those soon but the regular cube really put on a good show for everybody i would say wow gives me such a warm fuzzy feeling i was so excited i mean it, small you know compliment anthony corner here last year we talked about how there was some pushback to the regular cube being in top 64 the players that were drafting it were some of them very frustrated to be doing so and thought it was like not a real cube, some kind of like dumpy low power thing. They thought it was like didn't count, basically. We're frustrated to be drafting it. I thought we were in the compliment, Anthony Corner. <laughs> well, wait, but here's the thing. Uh, that was last year, right? And this year, I heard, first of all, none of that. I only heard pure excitement to play the regular cube. And also having it be streamed, I had the chat pulled up while the stream was going on and seeing tons of people be like, this cube is so cool. I'm going to be able to copy this cube. I'm so excited about this environment. I think it, you have just single handedly helped push this kind of magic further into the limelight uh, just by continuing to do your thing with the regular cube and not giving in and uh, just running powerful cards. So really exciting to see that for me personally. Super fun. Yeah, it's really fun to hear. And I love, I mean, it's just been so cool to see the cube community in general sort of grow and not just be about this card's great, this card sucks, but like, let's both do things that are super creative, like the Cascade cube, like the Changeling cube, and also just like open up all the space to just build the kind of cube you want with the cards that you want and feel totally justified about it because you should. Dom, is there anything else you want to say about KubeCon before we wrap up this episode? It was great. I'm going to make sure I'm there next year. Come what may. I would encourage people listening to to do so as well. I feel like that won't be a tough sell with uh, an audience listening to the Q podcast out there. But I, even to you know people in the competitive circuit or just the the magic space in general, I saw a lot of people expressing FOMO that they weren't here after seeing so many things. And I, I think it's really nice to have these people who are recognizable names from other spheres of magic just you know we had various streamers we had your know, reed and sam and so on i think lsv himself has said that he wishes he's he was here this year after seeing all of this good feedback so i'm optimistic that the next KubeCon can be even bigger even better uh, and catered to an even wider range of the audience and to, to come full circle here i do think cube is magic is the best way to you know take whatever personality traits or any kind of a creative spark you have and funnel it into 
the the game engine in some way i think cube is the best way of doing that within magic and so far kubecon has been the, the best way i found to do that within cube so and this is just as a play if i get a cube uh successfully accepted next year and they said that uh, at the current rate of scaling they will need a lot of submissions so I-, I will be deep in the tank you know coming up with a few candidates there then i'll get to watch people draft my baby and then get this good feedback good data on it and see where i can refine it there too so yeah i i am really optimistic about the future of this event it was a great event to be part of very glad that you guys had me back on to to wax uh, lyrical about it here and uh, just to I don't know, to talk about the the various aspects of the process and because it's so varied, like we're only scratching the, the surface for a lot of these, but that's that, that's a good problem to have, I think, that it can be so many things to so many people. Yeah, you are always welcome on to talk about whatever you want, Dom. You just, all you gotta do is DM me and we, uh, we gotta record one of these every single week, you know, and sometimes we're scrapping for ideas. So <laughs> this is a venue that you are welcome to use whenever you want. Uh, people listening to oh. this show should also check out your own podcast, Dominaria's Judgment, which I still listen to pretty regularly. I'll occasionally skip an episode if it seems like it's really about a very <laughs> detailed part of some meta that's not interesting to me. But, you know, for example, semi-recently you talked about the problem with slow play. And obviously slow play does not really apply in the same way to cube as it does to what you're talking about, like competitive constructed magic, where it's like a question of do you get draws in a tournament because you're playing slow and how do you solve this problem? But even just hearing Ari talk about what makes Fable the Mirror Breaker a slow card to play and the fact that it's got this front side, this back side, it's got a token, it has a decision on the second term that you can't plan for because it's after your draw step, then you have to decide what to discard. So you didn't get to pre-think ahead what you were going to discard and like all these like little layers, which are things I think absolutely should be on the radar of cube designers. You know, it's a great example of uh, how I get inspiration uh, for my own cubes by listening to a non-cube related show. So big recommendation to Dominaria's judgment there. Yeah, well, I am very grateful to hear that. Uh, funnily enough, in my absence this week, while I'm uh, hopping on a plane and going away again, Alpha Frog himself will be there talking about competitive cubing uh, with the, the team drafts over that he holds and the cube that he cultivates. So there will still be cube content there of some form. And then once I'm back next week, I think there will be a bonus episode with me going through my CubeCon experience you know, through that lens uh, first and foremost as well. I do have a question for you, Anthony, uh, while you're here and while I'm here as well. What, one of our last conversations, uh, someone you know, came up, introduced themselves, uh, and you asked s- something about uh, a famous Matisse painting called Dance. Now, <laughs> we were debating this after you had sidled off to the restroom after this, but is this a famous Matisse painting or is this a, like we went to art school, so of course we know about it, but you, you uncultured swine out there probably would not uh, level of famous for a painting. Just to clarify, are you talking to me or Anthony? I know I brought this up. Uh, <laughs> you I'm brought it up Andy. to me and asked if, <laughs> if everyone should know this. Well, my, my follow-up was, how many of the people in this room currently, like what percentage do you think could identify this painting if put in front of them? Okay, I, so you need to do a Twitter poll, and uh, then we'll, we'll just know. I, I think a big portion of the population, if shown the painting, the dance, and to be clear, there's two paintings called The Dance. There's The Dance and The Dance 2. They're almost identical, I think the dance two is technically the more iconic one, but I think a lot of people actually probably don't know there are two and think there's only one, but have seen both. I think a lot of people will recognize this painting and just be like, oh yeah, I've seen that before. I don't know what it's called. I don't even know who the artist is, but like that's a recognizable famous piece of art. And then yeah, if you're if you're art school swine like us, you probably know the title and whatnot. Yeah, I don't know. It's now always- the, the, the follow-up question, of course, is what makes a big portion, Andy? Uh, I bet... <laughs> 65% of the population would be like, yeah, I've seen that before. Dom asked me this, and I looked out at the CubeCon crowd there, and I said a much lower number. <laughs> I think a pretty low number would actually know the title of the painting or the artist, but like have the vague sense of like, yeah, I've seen that before, I think a pretty high percentage. But, you know, I am nothing if not out of touch, Dom. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know anything about what the regular people are doing out there. I am just all insulated in my little various content bubbles and i don't know what's going on in the real world so uh, that's my guess but uh don't put any money on it yeah this is uh my equivalent maybe of the people who complain about uh opening a pack of some like doctor who commander set and they know nothing about doctor who and they see this card which doesn't make any sense and who's this character and that's how i feel when uh, some of these discussions take place but i uh, good to know that yeah we, we can still appeal to a, a broad audience here. now dom if you look at this painting have you looked at this painting have you pulled it up does it have you ever seen it before i i Honestly, you cannot tell you. I, I'm sure I've seen paintings like it, but if you'd ask me what makes those paintings similar, could not tell you that either. So articulating that is uh, much easier said than done, I think. Yeah, I, I guess maybe why I have that sense is that I've seen many, many, many like parodies of this 
painting before where people have replaced the people with other things or tattoos of this painting. I don't know. I, like I said, I don't have any sense of what's normal, and I never, never purported to. Okay, I, I've never, I've never said I know what's normal, and I, I won't. Yeah, I, and I have no memory of what sparked that conversation in the moment, or what we were talking about before. I dragged it in this direction either. So I, I will hand the the, the the microphone back to you, and uh, you, you can ignore me in whatever in whatever way you see fit here. No, that's great. Actually, I mean, I remember we started this conversation, and uh, listeners to this podcast will know at some point in the future too. That's a little bit of a spoiler teaser, spoiler little, cliffhanger. Or things whatever. will happen in the future yeah i guess it's not a spoiler it's a teaser fine yeah thank you for your for your pedantry it's really appreciated all right well thanks a lot for joining us dom this was a great talk and it sounds like these two episodes of dominaria's judgment even if the rest of the episodes don't appeal to you if you don't care about healing about the ins and outs of constructed modern or whatever uh it sounds like at least these two episodes about cube will directly appeal to our audience so make sure you go check those out and uh yeah i subscribe to that podcast regardless of my inexperience and disinterest in playing constructed modern myself i still feel like i learn a lot about the game through it so we also have a couple things that you can check out on Lucky Paper website. We do have the survey up for the Doctor Who series. I'm not sure if we're going to end up doing a full set review episode for that, but oh, we'd still boy. love to have that data about what is uh, interesting to the Cube community for that, and we'll absolutely put that data up and write a little article about it. We also have two other articles. I wrote an article a little bit about the regular Cube, the Turbo Cube, and sort of my personal history and journey with Cube design and kind of where I'm at, which might appeal to a lot of our listeners. And Parker has also written an excellent article about Desert Cube design, talking a lot about Pulp Nouveau, his cube that was featured at KubeCon, and a lot of the sort of inspiration, influence, and things that he's learned along the way of creating cubes where you actually draft your lands along with all the spells. So check out all those cool things. Yeah, a big shout out to both those articles. They're both really great. And just very, uh, very honored that this dumb website we made people are like writing really good articles for for no money or anything at all. So. That makes it not a dumb website. The website is the articles. Yeah, that, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So check those out for sure. All right. That's it for this episode of Lucky Paper Radio. All of our music is produced by DJ James Nads- Nabsty. <laughs> I still am like... Nasty. I'm still fried from this weekend. Dom, you want to take this outro? <laughs> all of our music is produced... Me, me, okay. No, yeah, I, I'll take it. That, that's by cool. all I means, mean, Dom, My voice please. is fried too, as you can say. <laughs> please, please, please. All of their music is produced by DJ James Nasty. All the magic cards are produced by Wizards of the Coast, and this podcast is produced by Andy and Anthony sitting in Andy's basement talking about them and then dining me on Skype or on Discord. That's what this is, and I get to talk about them as well. Beautiful. You should come in every week and just do that for me. That would be a huge help. Thank you for uh, thank you for doing the outro and for doing the episode, Dom. Always a pleasure to have you. Always a pleasure to be here. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs>